on a note, they, they did, the bot lane. they did, uh... We were scrolling down the bot lane. They tricked me, Toby. A nightmare along, a brain up a song. Regeneration. <laughs> okay, I'll stop now. But I should definitely release a Christmas Dota 2 track. You should. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, will, we will do a Christmas Dota 2 wish list for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you get a present. You get a present. <laughs> Everybody gets a present! Like first spot oh on top God. lane. Whitebeard, well, he's gonna follow up with a fissure that's gonna hold Ragnarok up on this top lane. And this should be the first blood. There's nowhere to get out of this one. He's going into the tree line. He can attempt the TP out, but the arrow is perfectly on target from Fluff and stuff. So, Sneaky Nix Assassin spilled the first blood in the off laner. He'll instantly TP back up again, but... The creep wave is kind of going to be throttled anyway. I think that's why Fluff's over on the side here. He's going to pull from the side. Yeah, you obviously don't want to give up the first blood, but uh, at the same time, there is such a thing as tactical feed. It's obviously a bit of a joke, but at the same time, like your off lane is kind of, you have to make sure you get experience. And so playing aggressive like that, it has its downside. Sometimes you'll give up early kills, but at the same time, if you get the proper amount of experience to make a big mid game impact, it can still be worth it to some extent. Obviously, first blood is not really the kill you want to give up just because of that high amount of uh, net worth that is given away. But uh, it does appear he's going to be able to get a lot of experience out of this lane. Yeah. The, these supports need to start rotating soon, though. Like, okay, you got first blood over on, on the centaur, that's great. But if you look towards middle lane, TC's having a real rough time here. It's 2 2 up against a 7 3 right now. Now, Death Prophet normally relies on these Crib Swarms in order to keep up with the CS, primarily because snaking should be static leaking and draining out all the life, all, all the damage from TC. And it's just a, a base advantage anyway. Yeah, Snaking's doing, seems to be doing a really great job here in this middle lane. You notice that TC didn't actually go for a quick bottle, but instead went for the boots build. Now, that's just two different philosophies of dealing with it. I'm not sure if I would feel confident enough about my last hitting abilities mm. to depend on Death Prophet right clicks. He basically gets the boots first, and with Witchcraft, we'll be able to outrun the uh, the Razor, and obviously we'll be taking less uh, damage sap. Perfect. Oh, the nice arrow's going to connect. He's got no mana for a Crypt Swarm, though, so it's just yeah. physical damage to get into Snaking. Korok's moving in with a leap in from Fluffersoft. They've actually got it, but that means a follow-up's done from Korok. Also, with the Ignite, going to slow down Fluffersoft. He'll cut through the tree line, but he's going to juke this out, but he cannot. There's too much slow coming up from that. So it'll end up being a one-for-one -one trade off, but in my books that's kind of okay. Like you lose the Marana short, sure, but more importantly, you shut down the razor and you bought space for the Death Prophet. Oh absolutely. This now gets TC like quick time for his bottle, which he was seriously missing. Uh, when you're going up against Razor, you kind of need that spam ability. So now he's got boots and bottle, and thanks to the rune change up, he's always gonna be able to get a rune to refill his bottle as well. So uh, obviously, big upgrades. Ike's Mike seems to be doing pretty well in this bottom lane, though he may get caught out right now. Uh, he, he managed to burn off all the mana of Korok. Yeah. So Korok threw out the Ignite, but he got the Cog down, which pushed Korok back and took away that Fire Blast ability of his. Yeah, they, if, they had, if he still had enough mana for a Fire Blast, they could have slept him up, surrounded him. Oh, sneaking. Thrown down TC, Bottle Charge to keep him alive. Oh, the second geez. hit, though. He didn't have a second bottle charge available, so TC threw the Crypt Swarm out. I think at that point, too, he didn't really consider he'd be able to hit that properly. Now an arrow into Ragnarok. He's searching for a follow-up on TC. Now there's no mana for a Crypt Swarm, but there's a Fissure. And that will allow them to hold the central position long enough for also the Haste Rune to be bottled now up by TC. So he'll go back up to full life and mana again, and he goes 4-1 now on the board. Uh, Sneaky Nyx Assassin's doing a great job so far. Uh, four early kills, like four kills in four minutes. That's a lot of active rotation. You could see they're even potentially looking for movement down to the bottom lane, where Ix Mike has been doing fine. Like 11 CS is nothing to like really roam about, but it is a pretty good amount to start with. And oh, the counter ward just barely off the mark. Very smart ward positioning here, putting it outside, uh, like to the far right side, where more than likely most counter wards are going to be laid in this box right here. Yep. Should also flag something else. This top lane, like Ush has not been stopped at all. He is actually building into into treads. This is not what I was going to flag because he was walking around with 1200 gold on him. I thought, okay, we're going to look at a hand of Midas on the Wraith King, try and push him up to his level 16 really early on, and he just becomes a massive brawler with a death. Because with all Navi US have got, their burst damage is nice. 
uh, which they're actually using right now on IX Mike 88, and they're gonna dive in. The Cogs actually gonna lock Korok in. Excalibur, he's got no way out of this one. If he fidgets Whitebeard, he could actually end up killing off Excalibur. He held on to it, however. Now he'll throw the fidget. Korok, as well as Fog, locked in the tree lines. Whitebeard ticking down a little bit. He's gotta get this bug off him. 14 life points, he gets it off him, and Fog will not be able to keep up. So they definitely have to dive a long way in to kill off that clockwork, and they don't pick up the Earthshaker as well. Yeah, but this Wraith King, he's going to become really, really big. And I'm wondering if, like, for all Navi US, for their late game potential, Excalibur, 98 life points. Um, hello, Rocket from Clockwork, level 3. Yeah, but for everything they've got, they may not be able to control the Wraith King in the mid game. Yeah, I mean, it's it's that period of time where the Wraith King has so much mid-game impact where the Weaver is usually oh, off farming, he right? He, he drops off at a certain point. He's good landing presence, then drops off. Once he gets, like, Lincoln's, is still, tr still trying to farm up that second item. Oh, oh this is really smart. Nicely played. That is huge. That's a bottle down for Snake King. And extra room control for, for TC just because the Racer is less likely to go to runes when he doesn't have a bottle to fill up. It's very true. So you put that on the sideline, you get some good cash. And that also means, like, if is it, there's any critical items which were meant to be arriving soon, then they wouldn't be able to get it. But then again, at the same time, I'm looking at, at most of the players, and they got n very little to no money. That's uh, Navi US. Even Excalibur, he's getting really iffy about this bottom lane. Because Ix Mike went for a three point up in the rocket. So he's slowly whittling away at the live points of Excalibur. And this Ring of Health is not enough. It's not enough to repair the damage if he gets hit by every single rocket time and time again. And now they're going to go on middle lane. The fission hole snaking there, TC. He's going to trigger the ulti as well. Comes point blank range is sneaking. Throws out the Crib Swarm. Now TC's look, looking too healthy. The Hellfire Blast going to slow him down as well. And they can turn TC. He's bottle charging up. And they hold Korok in position. He's still going to burn out. I think he realized the Ignite was actually ticking out his life points there. So there's nowhere to survive. So Whitebeard and Fluffers have to try and turn for a revenge kill but un <laughs> incapable of doing it. Smart by TC, trying to output as much damage as possible onto the Ogre Magi, hoping to be able to get a kill on the Ogre in exchange for his death, but he was obviously going to go down there. The Ignite is a, a really powerful ability. In fact, you're seeing many teams actually prioritize the Ignite because if you just look at um, the, the DPS that comes out from that, it's much more viable Bog. sometimes. Hookshot, Cogs. Arrow. He was attempting to actually nightmare himself here, and Ice Mike 88 might still actually have some problems with this. Then again, brains out the fish a follow up and the Crypt Swarm from TC. He'll take the kill here and snaking a Ragnarok. The plants of field damage will be nice on the flop, but he leaves himself down into the river. And they're away to safety. Even giving some extra farm to TC, who's going to be picking up a bounty rune. There's also a regeneration rune up on top, which Whitebeard could head over and pick up right now if he wants to. But the vision belongs to Korok. So he's going to bottle that one up and save it. So a very successful first rotation by Ix Mike. He's going to be trying to build into a quick blade mail, which I really agree with here in this in this current lineup. Uh, you've got three different heroes you can pretty much punish. Um, the Centaur being one of the first and foremost. Razor definitely able to punish him as well. Um, these are heroes that you don't typically want to be close range with, uh, but you kind of help mitigate that damage and threaten the enemy hero even more by having that blade mail. So it kind of makes up for the fact that Clockwork has to be in close position with those heroes just due to the way he works. Um, but is able to pop that blade mail and actually turn that to what is usually a disadvantage for Clockwork into a further advantage for himself. I uh, want to ask you a question right now for Ush. Mm -hmm. Is Blink Dagger the best way to go here? He's walking around with 2200 gold at the moment. Should he become that rotating initiator as the Wraith King? Um, I think so. Um, it's either that. He didn't choose to go for the early hand of Midas, which is normally something I would like to see. I feel it's um, Wraith King is one of the best carries. Um, to run uh, hand of Midas because there's the levels. Yeah, exactly. It's I don't think that if you wanted to go a farming build You you would go for a hand of Midas and you wouldn't go for like uh, a quick maelstrom or something like that So I think he has to go for the uh, That blink dagger because he didn't go hand of Midas and try and have that really early impact um, And try and abuse that time basically this gives them early initiation They already have the clockwork, but with the Wraith King as well They're setting up the death profit for easy pickoffs easy team fights, which will allow them to take quick towers Yep, this kind of goes back to our conversation we we're having before the broadcast mm -hmm. Every team needs two good initiators in my mind to make this meta work it, and that's if, exactly yeah. what they have if you're this. going if you're going for early to mid game. Yes, absolutely like you have to 
just crush. You have to find those openings. You have to find those initiations. I mean, it was always true before, right? But now it feels like it's even more so due to the towers being tankier and harder to push through and take down the enemy lines. Um, it feels like it's even more important to find those pickoffs and those team fights to ensure yourself a big advantage before you go for the actual push. Navi US, they try to come over here for a bit of a smoke gank and find a hero out. Instead, they just find the triple stack of Sneak and Nix Assassins. So they'll be farming that one up. Oh. Even though Ragnarok takes a lot of damage from this, I think TC realizes it too. You might just be hearing that while on bottom lane, I, Mike88 wants to kill on Excalibur. But other stuff might just have to guess the arrow. Let it go through the catapult and catch him out. Fog's Nightmare over on TC, but there's that Blink Dagger from, from Ush. Going to work on a Fogged. He's going to try and beat him down. He's got a Hellfire Blast in three seconds and then a really great Fissure. Locks them in place. Snaking wants to TP out and there's, well, your extra stun from the Hellfire Blast. A double kill actually comes the way of TC. The Wraith King might be helping out, but they're pumping a lot of money now into this Death Prophet. Really great awareness by Navi US to go into the jungle like that and take away a stack. It's one of the most common things that Death Prophets will do for themselves on Radiant or Dire Side. Stack up the hard camp, farm it up for later, but they ended up getting caught and obviously not worth, in, worth stealing the triple stack if you give away a triple kill. You see right now the Weaver is uh, about halfway to that Lincoln's. Pretty good timing on him, but of course he is free farm in the bottom lane. And he's not going to be able to keep up, uh, I don't think, with heroes like Ush or Death Prophet, who should be tanking towers and finding team fights um, and successfully winning them as well. I mean, Sneaky Nix Assassins have a huge advantage in these 15 to 25 Mike, team fights. He's in trouble on bottom lane. Korok, he started off with a stun, went in for the Ignite after that. The arrow from Flubberstuff going to try and buy some space here. And with a jump in from Ush, they may just make this worthwhile, especially when TC arrives. Ush, he needs to get Korok down, and they will have him. He's bottling up as he's running away, but a Hellfire Blast will ensure the kill. So Weaver escapes and picks up possibly the most redundant rune ever, which is the regeneration. Especially when you have no bottle to actually use on this. And TC just wants to force the lanes. There's fortification available for the Radiant side. They haven't used it yet. There we go. Now it'll be used. But this tier 1 tower will still belong to Sneaky Nick's Assassins. And now the US just go for the trade off. The tier 1 tower in the middle lane. But already, SNA are TPing themselves back. Mike, he's got Hookshot available. Whitebeard also with the Slow Rage Fissure. Yeah, he wants him. Escalibur's hanging around way too long. Hookshot in. The Fissure can be careful by pushing him out. He'll actually time lapse out. The stun control wasn't there, but the Fissure will actually hold Excalibur in position. The battery assault, it's going to get in range in time. It cancels the TP. That's just last Shikuchi. There's no Fissure again, though, but they can see where he's running. In the center, Aldi will be used to get Excalibur away. Fluff. Shikuchi in three seconds. He's got enough time. That Perseverance regenerated up just yeah. enough mana for another Shikuchi. Yeah, Fluff could have tried to throw out a blind arrow, but uh, didn't go for it. Still, either way, that wastes a lot of time for, for the Weaver. Instead of going directly back to base with a TP, has now run his way all the way back and still won't have a TP to move back out. So it's still a lot of t lost time. Something small Excalibur did there. He was waiting a really long time in one position. That's why I was saying he's going to go on him. Ike's Mike is going to jump him because that time lapse isn't going to take him anywhere. Excalibur then actually realized his mistake and moved around a little bit. That way, when you get caught out by the clock where your time lapse moves you, outside of the cogs, which mm -hmm. is obviously very important for your escape. Well, for now, the T1 tower remains alive for Sneaky Nick's Assassins. They have one T1 tower up. Overall, their gold advantage is actually pushed above 4,000 now. So they're looking pretty damn good on that front. 1,500 for the experience, too. All, right, all they got to do is try and maintain their control, but they still have to make sure, make sure they bring down T1 towers. If they just hold back and the Weaver and Razor can get some space for farm, then you're going to start losing control of this map. Yeah, I, I tend to classify this as like holding the lead that you have to have. Right, yes. you, you've got the kind of lineup that means you need to have like a two to four k uh, advantage in golden experience by this point to the game, and try and continue to snowball that. There's still plenty of openings for Navi US to um, to make an opening to whether it's just draw this game out or potentially win a big team fight, upset that advantage that they're currently holding on to. I would say right now though, Sneaky Nick's assassins. If they could trade two for one, that's perfect. And they find a great pickoff on the Razor that. Yeah. He goes down where, where I was expecting kills to happen. I was expecting yeah, exactly. up on top lane for just a, a semi pickoff. Now, Fog. He's got Fiends from Revival. Flopperstuff's going to jump into Invis. They got the Moonlight Shadow being triggered. Uh, they're going to blink him. Ragnarok. Oh. Yes, he baited with the animation of, of the blast. But there was no follow up. 
the, the blast never never came to Ragnarok. Wasn't expecting that Wraith can just move himself back now. Fluff and stuff, he finds Fog again, Mike. There is no hook shot available. He throws a fishing arrow, won't find anybody. They just take the tower. They nice. didn't have to commit the exorcism either, which means pushing into the T1 tower in the middle lane is now an option for SNA. As long as they don't get caught out in their rotation, especially now that the Centaur is a blink dagger. But he's going to be too late for the fight. The ult is going to trigger Excalibur into Invis. Runs away, but TT's ult is still going to do a lot of damage here. Fiend's grip on, not snaking. You can't stay that close. The Cogs are pushing back. Fog will get stunned up by Fluff and stuff. And TT's ult is still trying to get to work. Bottles up as much as he can. Remember, he's still got a Yule Scepter for safety. But the Exorcism has been a little bit wasted here in the mid. They didn't pick up a kill. They forced a lot of rotation from Navi US, but... That's not what Nyx Assassins were looking for here. Yeah, and look at that. I mean, first we were talking about a Blink Dagger not so long ago, and all of a sudden there's a full-up Maelstrom up on the Wraith King, which now that is the item. If you're not going to go for Hand of Minus, you need a Maelstrom in order to keep up your farm. Because otherwise, I, I would say oftentimes on a carry um, Wraith King, I don't think Bleak Blade Mail is that effective anymore. It's too much of an early game strat. Yep. Yeah, you, you need to have a little bit more late game presence now. Their yeah. smoke's going to trigger, and this is going to reveal the fact that Wraith King's here. The Maelstrom's flying in at the same time, so it's going to deliver it, and he'll turn, try and fight. Reincarnation's there at level 2, and a hook shot in from Mike. He'll buy a little bit of space, pushing Excalibur back. They bring down the Centaur, and now Wraith King back to more the living. Sun's over in Excalibur. He has time looks available, but the arrow and fissure combination will bring him down. Mike losing his damage right now and giving it over to Snaking, probably more important. Another help by a blast. Buy some space here. TC is dominating the back end of, end of the play. But they've got through four heroes, and Korok is going to die pretty shortly after, especially when that Blink Decker follows up. The Death Prophet will take the double kill here. But that's a five for a reincarnation trade-off. Yeah, and they're going to lose their tier 2 tower in the bottom lane too. That's attack. one of those game-defining team fights right there. The four sneaky Nyx assassins were holding on to a lead that they kind of had to have. Now they've gone above and beyond the Call of Duty, just being like massively far ahead with that kind of team fight, plus being able to possibly take this tier 2. Remember, tier 2s are Radiant harder to take, and you're seeing that right here, attack. this push, where they the defending getting sold out. They're defending, but that blink dagger away. Ragnarok was never going to get that initiation. The Fissure holds back Ragnarok as well as so after TP goes, this center ulti has been wasted. They got no other way in, so the tower will not die in the bottom lane. But SNA don't really care about that. They can just look towards the tier one tower in the middle lane, mm -hmm. and they've still got Roshan on the on the dire side. For we sure. haven't even seen them go near that. But with a five second arrow, a good ultimate out from Acropolis, and uh, you've got Red King's like live steal anyway. Yeah, so I, there's, they, there's no problem. If they took that tier two in the bottom lane, that would have been just like the cherry on top, but it's not quite necessary just yet. It's only 17 minutes in. Uh, you still have a good 20 minutes before you even have to worry about, okay, guys, we need to start pushing up hills. So 20 minutes to take down the rest of the uh, that middle tier one and the rest of the tier twos. Yeah, I don't think that's going to be an issue whatsoever for Sneaky Nyx Assassins. With the Maelstrom that's already picked up by the Wraith King, he's going to be able to keep up a good level of farm, which is always important for these more active mid-game oriented carries. And he's probably going to be turning that into a Mjolnir, which is one of those like overwhelming teamfight abilities. It's it's kind of like having, like um, I, I just want to classify, kind of like having a Brewmaster on your team. Mm -hmm. He's a hero that just ensures that you win teamfights easily in the first 25 minutes because his ultimate is so incredible. Having a Blink Dagger, Maelstrom, or Mjolnir Static Charge Wraith King is one of those things where he just outputs so much damage to everybody in the team fight yep. and is so tanky you can't really target him fast enough to stop him from outputting that damage that uh, he just automatically wins team fights for you and they're going to be able to take towers off of that quite easily. Navi US just got to stall for time. That's their whole goal right now. It's just split push with the Weaver, uh, try and find pickoffs if you can, but how I think you you're getting to the point where SNA aren't going to spread themselves too thin. How are you going to split push to the Weaver, however? This clockwork, like, he can hook shit in from long range. Then if you have either Urshik or a Moran next to him, they should have enough damage to bring down the Weaver because the Weaver is just so poor. Oh, yeah. Like, sure, you got not an orb, but you're still sub 1k life points. So ganking over on this Weaver is quite easy. And setting a trap, two or three euros would be enough to catch out that Weaver. Mm -hmm. And his pushing power is quite shite as well. Yeah. Like, your split pushing is with Shikuchi more than anything else because your direct damage is only just over 100 a pop up against the creep wave, which is getting stronger and stronger. 
It's yeah. I 100% yeah. I agree with you. It's going to be very dangerous for Excalibur to try and split push. Um, he has to be really scared. Remember, there's also another small thing that was added with this last patch. Lincoln's no longer blocks Fisher. Yep. Oh, they found TC. He ran for the rune right now. Multicast two times over. And Ush gonna find some space. The Fiend script from Fog. Not enough to bash. Maybe it is. After Whitebeard comes up, the Yule Sip are up. Fog's already too low on life. He's oh, looking for no. the extra damage to Plasma Field. He'll finally end the Mega Kill streak. A hook shot down Mike, bumping into his own creep on the way down. It's a two for one trade off, but they're still 497 gold. But it's a lot more than that. Their experience changes through the roof for it. Ush, he came after uh, sneaking. He didn't get there in time. And that's what I was talking about, Sneaky Mix Assassins. You think you found a pickoff, but it's really just not, because they don't spread themselves too thin. They're all tanky enough, or at least their cores are anyway, that they're not going to get bursted down fallen. like that, even when you get that lucky multicast. So they're always, there's always going to be some sort of response, um, and a team fight will ensue. So it's not so easy for Navi US to just slip push and find pickoffs. Sneaky Mix Assassins are playing this correctly when it comes to positioning. Well, for now, man, Navi US, like you say, they need a split push. They need to do a lot of different things to get back in there. A little bit more of a favorable fight than a 1v2, even if it is a Death Prophet. Yeah. Unfortunately, they don't have a very good turtling he hero. Early there. on, early pushes, Plasma Field is good enough to deal with it. But yep. as we start going into later pushes, it's not going to be enough. They're going to lose out more here. Korok lets a leap into Arrow of Love and stuff, so Korok has no response to this. And with all these kills coming in, Wraith King, he's going to mop up this creep wave on the top, and that's actually his full Mjolnir already. Pre-20 minutes, because the, uh, the Courier's got the recipe. Now, I, I think what Korok is doing there is that aggressive push that you have to go for. Um, it, it so picking him, getting a pick off on him isn't as important. I think he's just trying to draw Sneaky Nick's assassins to focus more on kills than on towers. And that's something you oftentimes see. You, like many people would go look at that and be like, oh, Korok, what the hell are you doing? You're way far out there. You know you're going to get picked off like that. And he's just reading that as a risk that they kind of have to take. Not the US have to spread themselves out. If they're not going to find pickoffs, they just have to go for aggressive pushes and just accept that losses will come out from that. <laughs> Quick D ward over on the Radiant side, so this is very obvious that Roshan is being done, but as we said before, Exism does most of the damage you're searching for. Wonderful blink there by Ush, so uh, a little short of the mark. Uh, uh, Ush is watching the peasants at work, <laughs> and that he's going to come in and take that reincarnation. But would he? I, I don't know. I mean, honestly, Roshan Death Prophet and Wraith King are both to the uh, heroes with an Aegis. I, but I would say Wraith King is a little bit better than that's, Death Prophet. That's why I thought like you give it to somebody else. Like it might almost be worthwhile giving it to. Yeah. Let's see where my brain first went to. Because you, 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 you got a level but... two reincarnation. TC I would have given it to more than anybody else. But it's just because he's like you know he, he does trigger exorcism, and then you don't really care that much. Wraith King, Moonlight Shadow farming up and just fighting up against Snake King. He's got Wraith Fire Blast in one second time. And he knows there'll be enough damage. Well, actually, maybe it won't be. He's given so much over. They finally go invis. There's your Hellfire, the, your, your Wraith Blast coming up. They use the Central to try and get themselves out, while Mike, they seem to call out everybody else, including Escalibur, a point blank range hook shot, in making sure he could not time lapse out snaking. Well, the damage may have been removed from Ush that entire time, but they cannot get the upper hand in the fights. Ike's Mike just came in. Beautiful. Invised up. Found a two man Cogs. I, I don't think you can ask for much better than that. Uh, a two man Cogs without using your hook shot. Like, that's, that's pretty much unstoppable right there. Yep. Ike's Mike winning them even more kills than they should have had. And Navi US, uh, they didn't go for their split push. I'm not sure why they put Razor and Weaver in the same lane and then actually tried to do any sort of fighting whatsoever. That, that, that just gave up a tier two, essentially. Like those tier twos are hard to break through now with the 25 armor that they hold on to. So I don't think you should be losing these tier twos just yet. And if you do, it's going to take quite a lot of time, I think, for SNA to eat through them with like constant harassment and stuff like that. Um, and that buys a lot of time for the Weaver. But as it is, they grouped up in one lane, the Weaver got picked off, and they gained nothing in exchange for that tier two going down. Yep. And they're going to lose more for it now. That the advantage is so far ahead for SNA that it's not even just chip damage away from tower. It's let's just push. Like we know we can win fights. You've yeah. got reincarnation still up and running with an Aegis of the Immortal behind you, and it's the reincarnation that triggers before the Aegis of the Immortal. So technically, like you don't have to waste Radiant's your Aegis on the first death. Is under and Snaking's trying to force up the mid. 
The fish are being baited out by Whitebeard, but that's not the place they're looking to engage. If he hung around, they probably would have had a crack at it. Yeah. You got Rave King Solo taking out a towel while Navi US are busy just trying to control their lanes. It's not even a split push, it's just control their lanes. Yeah, they they basically Radio show they found one. They found Karate. Oh, and again, where are you blinking to? He finds Fog instead. That's a lot of damage. He tried to brain sap there, but he died before he could even get one ability off. And the rotations continue. Sneaky Nix is at since making sure that Navi US do not get a single tower out of yep. these trades. This is a mental victory, but they've lost it now. Hook shot up though, and you got thinking, oh, you got bigger. He can Excalibur caught inside this, and there'll be a lot of damage from TC Excalibur. No time lapse. The vision connects. The silence was beautiful there from TC, but of course it was all set up by IX Mike's wonderful hook shot initiation. Once again, like they gave up a tower, but the rotation was still perfect. You just killed the heroes. So you took away that unreliable gold. They just one for themselves. Oh, uh, they jumped. It's always jumping onto Korok. The Fiend Scribbles actually keep flopping the stuff out here, so there's no follow up. Ragnarok, Hulk's not even creeps at this point, but look at the damage coming up from the Raid King. He'll hold him back, but the GG call is there. Fissure from Whitebeard just to like put the sugar on top of the cake. That's it, man. That's uh, that's game number one. SNA looking very, very strong here in game number one. The initiation lineup was perfect, the Raid King got space, and then he actually made use of the space he got. Like that, that Blimp Dagger with the Treads, his first rotation were always in the right money. And after getting the first one on Ragnarok, we never really felt the presence of that Centaur either. Be it from his ultimate, or be it when the, when the Blimp Dagger first arrives, like, ah, now there's a chance, but there was no chance, there was no opening, there was no gap, there was nothing. Yeah, there were no pickoffs available whatsoever for Navi US to take advantage of. The few times that they tried to jump fights, every single time they were punished by an actual team fight. They thought they were finding a pickoff, the result was there were like three or four heroes around from Sneaky Nix Assassins and they end up trading like one for three or some really bad exchange. Sneaky Nix Assassins, the supporting cast, I have to say their movement was beautiful. They lost one tier one during that whole entire time. Um, every single time they would go for a push into a tier Tier two, they know they have that tier two, so the rest of their heroes, they would leave like Wraith King there to solo push it, uh, because they know they can afford to have that Wraith King forward. He has reincarnation, mm -hmm. he has a blink dagger. He's fine if there shows up to be five heroes defending that tower, and the rest of the cast would rotate around and stop the, those two one tower pushes. So there are no trade offs whatsoever. Every single time, sneaking Nick's assassins, perfect movement around the map. Well, let's see if they can do it in the second game, because if they win that, they're going to Dream Act Bucharest and playing up against three of the top teams that Europe has to offer. So stay tuned. We'll be back for more action here for the D2CL.